Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. It took three years to complete. Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, to this day, is still the most popular Christian piece of art in the world. You find it on carvings, on canvas, on carpets, on pretty much any medium imaginable. You find it in homes, you find it in churches. It is an amazing piece with lifelike facial expressions that depict emotions unable to be captured by its contemporaries. The 15 foot by 29 foot painting became an instant masterpiece of timeless design and characterization when da Vinci made it in, in 1498. But did you know that ever since it was completed in 1498, there's been something wrong with it? Nearly since the time when he finished it, it's been falling apart. You see, da Vinci, ever the inventor, wanted to do something different in his creation of this masterpiece. So rather than use the traditional wet plaster that was typically used for murals like this, he decided to use dry plaster. It was beautiful artistically, but as far as durability goes, not so much. Almost from the time it was created, it's been crumbling. And people have been trying to restore their original ever since. You could say, the Last Supper is not lasting. Tonight is Maundy Thursday. Tonight we find Jesus 2,000 years ago at the original scene of the Last Supper, gathered with his disciples in a borrowed upper room to celebrate the feast of the Passover. The Passover was the central feast of, of the entire Jewish worship calendar. Everyone looked forward to it, including Jesus and his disciples. They looked forward to it, but this night, this night would be different. They would have started with a review of the history of God's <coughs> grace. They would have heard, they would have recalled how, how God used the blood of a lamb painted on doorposts and on lintels to protect and save his people as the angel of death passed over Egypt. They would, they would remember how, how God had led His people, his, the Israelites, His people, out of slavery in Egypt with a pillar of, of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That at the high point of the meal, they would have recalled, they would have listened with rapt attention, with eyes wide open as, as, the, as their teacher retold for them that ancient, that ancient Bible lesson of how God had actually parted the waters of the Red Sea so His people could go through to safety. But then He made those walled waves come crashing down on their pursuing enemies. As the disciples ate this meal and enjoyed this celebration, as they listened intently, they, they would have felt a connection to their past and to their God because they were His people. They, they felt a connection to one another. Since this family history of the Israelites was their own family history, it certainly was the most special night of the year for them. But this night would be different. In the middle of the celebration, with no fanfare or fuss, Jesus did something new and different. He instituted an entirely new feast. But you wonder how much those disciples understood even a fraction of the significance of what he was doing for them. Surely it was something different. It was different from what they had experienced every year since childhood. But, but they had other things on their mind. Earlier that night, they had been so busy arguing with each over, other over who is the greatest in, in, in the kingdom of in Jesus' kingdom that, that they forgot to do the servant's task so, of washing each other's feet, or washing feet before the meal. So Jesus took it on himself to do that. Jesus spoke to them then of, about betrayal by one of his own disciples in that room who is going to sell him out that very night. So 
naturally filled them with sadness. They, they were filled with uncertainty. Their minds were on other things, trying, just trying to enjoy the celebration of the Passover. So Jesus did something special for them. Jesus took the unleavened bread, that original Passover meal uh, from the menu there. He took that unleavened bread. He broke it and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to them and said, this is my body. He didn't explain it. He didn't say it symbolized his body. He didn't say it was something to be adored. His words were plain and clear. Take it. This is my body. And so they did. And they ate it. Then he took the cup of wine, offered it to them, and said, This is my body, or this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Again, Jesus made no further explanation of what he meant. It wasn't symbolic of his blood. It wasn't something to be adored. His words were plain and clear. This is my blood. He gave it to them to drink it, and they did. Jesus' words made it very clear that this new feast with his disciples was something special. Something different than any other Passover feast before this. No doubt they wanted it to last. If we were in their sandals, I'm sure we'd want to do the same thing. We'd want it to last. Even, even if we or they didn't understand why he was doing that. They wanted that last supper to last, but as eager as Jesus was to eating that Passover meal with them, he didn't want it to last. In fact, he couldn't, he knew it couldn't last because of what was coming in the next 24 hours. In just a few hours, what Jesus had said about that one who would betray him would come true. One of his own disciples, Judas Iscariot, would sell him out to his enemies. Jesus would be arrested. He would be cruelly judged by the religious leaders who should have recognized him as the Messiah. He was going to be ridiculed and beaten condemned and, and hauled off to the courts of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. He would be flogged. He would be condemned again. And then would have, be forced to carry a heavy wooden cross out to a hill better known as the Skull outside of the city of Jerusalem. He would be nailed to that rough wooden cross, lifted up and left to suffocate to death. Jesus knew all of that was coming. All in just a few hours. And he knew why it was coming. Why that last supper could not last. You see, Jesus had to prepare the way for a lasting supper. So Jesus, once again, grabbed the attention of his disciples, and he grabs our attention, as he simply says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine. In other words, my friends, I need to leave. If my body and blood are going to be given and poured out for you, then this meal cannot last. I need to, if, I, if I'm going to do just that, I can't enjoy this meal again or any longer until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Now, if there was, was one word on that uncertain night that those disciples could lean on, it was that preposition, until... It's a word of promise, a word of hope. So much of that night was wrapped up in the past as they celebrated God's gracious deliverance of his Old Testament people from slavery in Egypt. So much of that night was wrapped up in the present as Jesus turned that last supper into the Lord's Supper, emphatically declaring, this is my body and this is my blood poured out for you. Jesus' suffering was already at hand. Yet neither the emphasis on God's deliverance of the past, nor his present suffering or the present sacrifice and offering of himself as the Lamb of God would have meant a thing. If all that wasn't tied up into that, if the future wasn't tied, if there wasn't a future tied up in that single word, until. Tonight you and I also lean on that word until. Through the Holy Supper, Jesus invites you to look back. Jesus wants you to eat and drink in remembrance of Him, recalling and proclaiming His death for you. But Jesus also, also wants you to look inside as you examine your life. With that stethoscope of God's law on your heart, the diagnosis of your self-examination cannot be anything more 
and that you are guilty of sinning against God, that you rightly deserve His eternal punishment, and that you desperately need the forgiveness that can only come through Jesus. As you come to the Lord's table tonight, Jesus also wants you to look around, to rejoice and give thanks for the unity that you share with those kneeling next to you and receiving that body and blood of Christ with you. Look around and appreciate, as Paul said, that we who are many form one body because, or for we all partake of one loaf. But above all else, above looking back, above looking inside, above looking around, as you come to this table and as you leave this table tonight, your Savior invites you to look forward. Look forward until that day when he drinks it anew with you in the kingdom of God. That certainly doesn't downplay the amazing, tremendous blessing we're going to receive tonight. Jesus has made it clear through his words and promise that he himself is miraculously present in this meal tonight. He is here giving himself in, with, and under the bread and wine, these earthly elements, through his word. As you receive his body and blood, he offers you the forgiveness of sins that only he can give to you. So enjoy this meal tonight. It's an awesome supper. Hear the words spoken so many years ago and hear them personally said to you by your Savior. Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Take and drink. This is my blood shed for you. Savor this meal tonight and every time you come to the Lord's table. Yet do so knowing that our Savior's goal is not to simply dine with you and me like he dined with his disciples at the Last Supper. But instead, he gave his body and blood so you and I could have reservations for a lasting supper. A lasting supper where he eats and drinks with us anew in the kingdom of God. Now, what that heavenly banquet is going to be like, what it's going to feel like, what it's going to taste like, what it's going to look like, I can't tell you. But it's going to be something new. Something you've never experienced before. No longer will you have to look inside for sin because you will be clothed in a white robe of righteousness tailored by the blood of Jesus. No longer will you have to look around you with sadness because we can't share this feast with everyone. Because in heaven, we're going to have perfect unity. No longer will Jesus simply be with us sacramentally. No, Jesus will be with us visibly. We will see the Savior face to face. The Savior who suffered at the hands of sinners like you and me. The Savior who prayed for his enemies, who promised paradise, and who finished the battle for your salvation. We will see the Savior face to face, who conquered death, and who dries our tears, and who will welcome you into that heavenly feast with hands that still bear those marks of love made by the nails so long ago. There we will enjoy a supper that will be simply breathtaking. So my friends, on this holy night, as you follow Jesus tonight, as you look ahead to the tomorrow and, and to Easter Sunday and the continuing celebration, I want you to rejoice and to look forward to that lasting supper with your Savior that will never end. Amen.